Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we are going to continue with our NRF 52 project. And in this stage of the project, what we're gonna do is we are going to place an antenna in the PCB layout, and we're gonna go over all the matching conditions, and then I'll show you how to route that into the NRF 52. So if you haven't been keeping up with this latest project that we've been working on, check out the links in the descriptions. You'll be able to see parts one and two, and then of course, grab your copy of Altium Designer and follow along with us as we dive into this antenna matching section. Let's go ahead and get started. So let's jump back into this project. So since we last left off, I've completed uh, pretty much all of the routing except for ground and this antenna section that you can see right here. Everything else is all pretty much ready to go. We could even add in USB if we want by the time we get done. But the first thing that we need to do is to decide a couple of things. So first we need to decide what type of antenna are we gonna use. And then we need to, of course, determine all of the matching conditions so that we can actually route into that antenna. If we're gonna do a printed antenna, um, you're generally gonna go with one of two options. You could go with just a simple microstrip antenna that's gonna be essentially like a quarter wave antenna, or you could go with like a patch antenna, and then you could use like a parallel patch or a series patch antenna array if you wanted to. So the series and parallel patch array are something that you'll see more commonly on much higher frequencies, simply because it makes the size of the antenna smaller. But what we could do is go with a patch antenna. So I've done some calculations here with the standard patch antenna formulas, and um, we'll be doing another video on how to actually do this type of design for a patch antenna. But what this would have is you would have a feed line going into the antenna, and then what I calculated was with these dimensions and a cutoff of 2,520 megahertz, you would have an input impedance right here at the port of the antenna of 225 ohms. The NRF52 coming out of this pin here and then going through your matching network should have an impedance of 50 ohms. So this feed line would need to be a quarter wavelength line if we were going to use a patch antenna. And then this quarter wavelength line would essentially convert this input impedance of 225 ohms into a 50 ohm impedance seen at this portion here. So with these parameters or with these component values for L1 and C1 in our Pi filter, we would then get a characteristic impedance for this filter of 50 ohms. So let's see how this compares to what we have in our design right now. So if we go back to this section, we've got a few capacitors here and these were pulled off of another design, but we're just gonna check these values here. So here we have a 0.8 picofarad and then here I believe we have also, oh, we have a 0.5 picofarad capacitor and then here we have a 1.2. So we could use this 1.2 picofarad capacitor here and here. Now here, this inductor, let's see it's 4.7 nanohenries. But from this, we need about 6.2 nanohenries. So what we can do is we can actually look up an alternative component and then we can add that into the schematic. So we're just gonna replace this, delete these two, and then replace them with this capacitor. So that's how we're gonna have to change our matching network. We have two options here that we could implement pretty quickly for a patch antenna. So one of these is of course the patch antenna that I've designed here. Now we need to make a lot of room for this on the board because look at the dimensions here, right? This is 40 millimeters or, you know, four centimeters, right? So four centimeters would essentially be about an inch and a half of board space, okay? And if we just look at the amount of space that's taken up by the components right now, we can see that it's only about an inch and a quarter. So the antenna is actually gonna be bigger than all of these components. So it essentially be like a big square like this. So we can do that, you know, we can move all of these components up if we wanted to, we could put them up here, and then we can put a big patch antenna down here if we really wanna do that. That's certainly an option. I think for us, just for the moment, it's gonna be easier to just go through this Pi network change, and then we'll see what the new circuit looks like, we'll import it, and then what we'll do is we'll decide which antenna we wanna place. So now once we've got the new components into the board, we can move these guys over. We now have our new inductor here as well. 
So we've got everything that we need to start arranging all of this. Um, one thing that I always like to do when I have these new components come in is to change the text height because the default height and the stroke width can be pretty big. And then I like to usually change the font to sans serif, but sometimes I'll just you know leave it as is. So we have our two capacitors that we need to add in here and we can go ahead and place these. Now you'll see that this new inductor is just a little bit larger. That's okay for the frequencies we're working at. Now we can just move our designators back over here and we can line all this up and we're basically gonna be ready to go. So the next thing that we need to do is determine whether we wanna go with a patch antenna or if we wanna go with a printed microstrip antenna. So a patch antenna is pretty simple. Essentially, you would just put this over a ground plane, and then you need to calculate the impedance of this quarter wavelength line uh, so that you transform this 225 ohms into this 50 ohms. If you just go back and watch the quarter wave transformer video that we did uh, just recently, you'll find a link in the description. You'll see a procedure for doing that. So essentially what we do is we just take 225 multiplied by 50, take the square root. And so we can see that we would need a 100 ohm line here. So we would just need to size the width of this so that its impedance was 100 ohms. So we can do that pretty quickly. Here we just go to the layer stack manager and I can create an impedance profile and since we're going to have ground on the next layer, we can use that to then determine uh, what the width of that line should be so that we hit that 100 ohm impedance. So if we go up here and we just put in 106 ohms as our target, we're immediately going to see that our width requirement is very narrow. So this is where it becomes a bit impractical. Either we would have to put a ground cut out here, or we would need to, of course, use a totally different material. And a totally different material isn't really gonna help us here. So this is an exercise we could go through and do, and we could certainly do that if we wanna get a patch antenna into this board. But I think a better strategy for us is gonna be to use the microstrip antenna that was actually in the NRF reference design. So if you open up the NRF reference documents, and you take a look at their PCB. As soon as it comes up, you'll be able to see their microstrip antenna that they used in their dev board. So their microstrip antenna is pretty simple and it's something that we can just grab and copy. So if I just zoom in here on layer one, you can see right here that this is their antenna. And then they're coming off of their matching network and you can see the component outlines here on their matching network. Then they also have an optional coaxial connector right here, and then they have a matching capacitor for that coaxial connector. So they can certainly um, use J1 for that connection as well. But what they've done is they've used this set of traces here as their antenna. And let's go ahead and grab this, and we're gonna copy this, and then we're gonna go back over here, and then we're gonna just place this in the board. With all of this in the board now, what we can do is just grab all this, we can move everything up. We can then route everything. So we've got all of our components placed. We're essentially ready to route everything and we can just drive it straight across. All we need to do is just grab the trace tool and start moving everything through. So one of the things that you'll need to do as you come into C12 here is you'll need to set the width to a thinner value so that you can route in underneath that BGA and then you can route directly over to C2 here. And then you can make this connection to L1, and then you can make the uh, connection over here to C11. And then this connects to our antenna. So we now have everything connected just how we need it. And you'll see a design rule violation here, but the reason that there's a rule violation here is because of the width constraint. So we're above the maximum value for the width constraint for this net. So if we wanted to, um, we can just go through and just ignore it. Or one thing that you can do is, of course, on this routing rule, you could create a new rule that will allow you to exceed that maximum width. I'm just gonna change this and make it width A and T, and we'll just make the max width 50. It's gonna apply to net antenna, and we'll hit apply, hit okay, and then you'll see that clears up the design rule error. Last thing we wanna do here is we're just gonna set this to 20 so that it matches the rest of our feed line, and we now have everything done here for this routing. The next thing that we would wanna do is place ground around this. 
And then we also want to make sure that we leave a ground cut out here. So with this being a printed antenna with no ground, you can actually see that here in this reference design. If we just go down to the bottom layer, you'll see here that they have ground cut out everywhere in this design. They've also done it here below this section of trace. And the reason that they claim to have done that is so that they're eliminating excess capacitance. In this case, the impedance of this section and the length of this section is such that the input impedance looking out of this section of the circuit is just going to appear to be the input impedance of this antenna section. So this antenna is gonna be just fine for what we need to do. And that's exactly what we're gonna leave it as uh, here in this PCB layout that we've developed with our NRF. So what we're gonna do is just kind of copy a couple of those guidelines here and make sure that we leave some ground cut out around this antenna so that it can operate to its designed impedance spec. So to do this, normally what we wanna do is then just set the board size and then we can fill in with ground where we want it for the rest of the circuitry. It would be a good idea here to also ensure that you've got good ground stitching around this set of components and this feed line going into the inner layers. And so on the inner layers, we would also want to place ground. And then finally, we would want to then wrap it up with ground on the bottom layer. And we'll see exactly what clearances we need to have between these traces and the ground on the top layer in order to ensure that everything is at this target of 50 ohms. So first let's just adjust this antenna and then we'll start filling in with some ground. Okay, so now we have our ground region. I usually pour them kind of irregularly when we first get started here and we're trying to wrap this kind of board up. But on this one, what we can do is we can just kind of bring this back. It may even be a good idea to reverse this in the X direction. So to do that, you just hold it, hit X, can move this guy over here, and then we'll create some more clearance around this, just moving this up. So I think this makes the uh, the whole antenna a little bit more compact. And then just re-pour everything, and now you'll see we have our antenna section sufficiently isolated from the rest of our components. So this looks pretty good to me. The last thing that we would wanna do is just define the board shape, extend this over, and then we can worry about putting ground on the next layers, as well as a ground cutout around this, and then we can put some stitching vias. Now, as I mentioned before, we wanna make sure that these feed lines hit a 50 ohm target. It's not necessarily mandatory in this case, but it's one of those things where even though they're short sections of transmission lines, it's extremely easy to just hit a 50 ohm target. So what we're gonna do is we're just going to check that we're close enough to a 50 ohm target. So here we have a 20 mil wide trace. And if I just measure the clearance, or look it up in the design rules, you can see here that the clearance is, it's about four mils. And we can just check that in the design rules real quick. So just looking in the design rules, if I go up here to clearance and look in the clearance rule, you'll see that the clearance here is set to uh, four mils everywhere. So what we can do is we can take those two numbers, go back into the layer stack, and we're gonna change this back to, of course, four mil dielectric, that's what we had before and we're using a single coplanar with a target impedance of 50, and then our width here is 20, and our spacing is four. And so here, you can see that this gets us to a really low impedance. So this again is another reason that we use that ground cutout, because if we put a ground cutout all the way through to this bottom layer, essentially the ground cutout is gonna set a distance of it looks like 16 plus 37, which is 53 mils. You could then change the layer reference. And if I were to say, set this to the bottom layer, you're gonna see here that even with a width of 20, spacing of four mils, it sets the impedance in this case to 48.94. So now that we've done this work in the stack up, what we're gonna do is we're gonna define that polygon cutout and place ground on the lower layers. Once I go through this and I re-pour all the polygons, you're then gonna see that it's going to automatically apply that cutout on the layers that we just specified. So here you can see I just scroll through. I've only got the ground on the top layer and the bottom layer and everything else is ready to go. So the last thing that I'm gonna wanna do here is to just put some stitching vias around this and the reason I'm putting those stitching vias is there's a couple of reasons. One, I wanna put the stitching vias around to provide some shielding for these nets. 
But two, I also want to make sure that I tie these ground regions together within the vicinity of these components. So that way, any return current that is being induced into the ground net from the signal traveling along uh, this direction is going to be able to then be induced directly back into the ground plane. We can do that just by manually placing some vias along this section and then along this section. Last but not least, since we have a bunch of ground everywhere, we would want to then add in stitching vias on this ground net. And then finally, we of course want to set the board size. So to set the board size, of course, that's pretty simple. I'm just going to use a rectangle and drag this out and we'll take it all the way over to here. And then with this, I can just select it and then design, board shape, find shape from selected objects. So we're coming right along on this layout. I'm going to delete this. We'll move these sections over so that all of this is filling out the entire board and so that we get a nice clean board with just this one antenna on it. Now you'll remember that this was just one of the antennas that we copied over from the reference design, but there's still another antenna option. And that antenna option was from J1 in this layout. So if you look right here, we have J1 here. And if I look at this in 3D, you can see that this is a coaxial connector. So this would actually connect to another antenna, like a rubber ducky antenna, or uh, maybe like a coax connector that then connects to another patch antenna. You have option to add that in just by you know, copying these two components into the schematic and then you would just put them on this net and you would then import them and if you wanted to use those components um, it's pretty simple you could just place them right here just the same way that was done in the reference design so that's an option the other option would be to use like a chip antenna and a chip antenna is going to work essentially the same way you could just put the chip antenna off to the side make sure that you include any matching network for it and that's maybe something that we'll do in another video because it's something that we periodically have to do on these feed lines. As it is, we've got an antenna in here that'll work. The other option, of course, as I mentioned, is you could extend this board out way down here like this, and then you could put in this patch antenna. Make sure to stay tuned for an upcoming video because we'll actually outline how to design this type of patch antenna and do these calculations and then you'll be able to implement that into your own projects. So I've gotten the layout to this point and you can see here that I've added in via stitching everywhere on the design. So I'm going to run over this via stitching and then run over some of the other cleanup that we need to do. So first, this via stitching that has been added to this ground plane. This via stitching is separated by 100 mils. So how did we get to that distance and why did we choose that? Well, the primary reason is twofold. So first, we want to make sure that we have a nice low impedance ground connection anywhere uh, across this stack up. And so you can see here um, that we've got a lot of ground poured pretty much everywhere in the design. And having all of that via stitching ties all of that together. So that's the first reason. But the second reason is because this antenna is going to be radiating at 2.4 gigahertz. And so we want to make sure that the via stitching here is spaced close enough that we can lock propagation of 2.4 gigahertz waves into the substrate traveling back into this section of the board. So to do that calculation is really simple. First, we know that the DK of the board is four, so we can calculate the speed of light in the material. Um, this is in meters per second. Then we're gonna divide by the frequency. This is in meters now. This is the uh, wavelength in meters, and we're gonna convert that to millimeters, and then we're gonna convert that to mils. So the wavelength of a 2.4 gigahertz signal traveling through this board in the dielectric with DK equals four is basically two and a half inches. So if we take the one eighth wavelength cutoff, which is uh, a decent cutoff to use here for these stitching vias, then just calculating the eighth wavelength, we would see that an eighth wavelength is 312.5 mils. 100 mil pitch between stitching vias is uh, below this limit. So that's pretty good. So that means we're going to have high shielding effectiveness through this via stitching array. So that's the reason that we picked that 100 mil spacing. Some of the other cleanup that you want to do is, of course, go into Design, Layer Stack Manager. And then when the layer stack comes up, we want to uh, make sure that these layers are appropriately named. So normally you would do this at the outset of the design. We were playing around with the layer stack a little bit. It's okay in this example project that we didn't do it at the beginning. But um, we would want to go through and give all of these, you know, a decent name and essentially go through and finish up the names so that they are very clear. So we'll just do, you know, L2, L3, 
L4 and L5 on the inner layers. So now that we have that finished, those layer names are going to appear in a fabrication drawing if we use the Draftsman utility. Some of the other cleanup that we need to do if we just look on uh, 3D is we actually need to pull off the solder mask on these tracks. So there's a very simple way to do that. And essentially what you can do is you can just select all of the tracks that are part of this connection and just select and hit the tab key. And then what you can do is you can actually copy all of these and then you can move all of these onto the top solder layer. So if we move all of these onto the top solder layer, those shapes are all going to be replicated onto that top solder layer. And then when we look at this in 3D, we can see that all of the copper is exposed. So the reason we're removing that solder mask is because it adds just a little bit of extra loss to this antenna, and then removing that, of course, removes that loss. Now, we would want to make sure that we plate this appropriately. If we were operating at 5 gigahertz or higher, I would say we would want to avoid nickel plating. In this case, we're only at 2.4, so we could certainly get away with using nickel plating. Some other little cleanup that you would want to do is select all the vias and apply a tolerance to them. This is gonna be important if you go to manufacture this. You can see here we already have tolerances set, so that's okay. The blind vias here and the buried vias are gonna need different tolerances. Make sure you consult with your fabricator before you get this thing into production in order to get make sure you have the right values. And then we can also see we have one unrouted net here, so we're gonna to wanna to go back and route that net. So we'll handle that in just a moment. But the other thing that I've done is I've actually made some changes in the schematic. So you can see here I added a new circuit, I added a real-time clock, and then I also swapped out the debug header for this SWD header. So this is what we're gonna to use to actually connect this board to a Presto programmer so that we can flash it with firmware. So since I've made these updates, um, I'm just going to go ahead and import them into the board. Just make sure we validate everything. Let's execute and make sure this all gets accepted. And we can see it, even though we had a few errors in the initial check, everything imported properly. You can see here we've got our new stuff imported. And we're going to have to do some cleanup here on this connector. Do a little bit of rerouting, uh, but that's okay. We'll get that cleaned up and then we can get this guy into production. The last thing that I'm going to want to do is I'm going to take this connector and I'm gonna actually move it to the back layer. Then what we can do is if I just go to the bottom layer, maybe we take this and we rotate it 180 degrees. And what we can do is we can move this guy up. We can actually place a couple of vias here and we can drop those connections down to that back layer. If we go back to the back layer here, then you can see where these pads are and then we can just route into these pads. So that's a pretty simple way to move that connector to the back layer, get it all routed in, and now it's good to go. And so when we do the polygon pour, you can see it's automatically gonna clear out some spacing for this. So now going back to the top layer, um, you can see here, we do have some rerouting that we have to do. We can just kind of get started by just selecting these particular vias, deleting those, and then we may wanna actually turn this around so it's much easier to access VBAT and VDD1 then we can go through and finish up all of the routing. So I'm gonna leave it here for now because this is getting to be a pretty long tutorial, but we'll probably end up placing these two on the back side as well. And I think that will complete everything. We can wrap this up and then get it into production. All right, thanks everybody for watching this. We're gonna produce this board soon. And once we produce it, we'll have some fun testing it. I'm gonna go through and finish all of the cleanup, make sure that I've got all of the connectors on here that I want. I'll probably add in USB before we're done. And that'll be that. Make sure to subscribe, hit that like button, leave your comments and questions in the comments section. And finally, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks. Yeah.